Hello, uh, my name is Patty Vilma, I'm a solicitor with Bennett Carroll Solicitors and today I'm with Guy Gibbons, the CEO of Bennett Carroll Solicitors. Today we're going to talk about why each of us should have a will. Guy, can I make my own will? Yes you can. Uh, in fact, uh, there's a bunch of people that create a form that you can buy from your news agent for 50 bucks or so uh, and you can um, fill in that form. Now you'd expect me to, to throw mud at that form, but the form is actually not too bad. Uh, it's reasonably easy to understand and you'll probably get it all completed the way that you should and you'll probably go through the very formal process of getting it signed and you'll probably get that right and your witnesses will probably sign in the places where they're supposed to sign and it'll probably be alright. But if it isn't, then uh, your relatives will be paying many thousands of dollars to people like us to try and clean up the mess. And we see them, as you know, quite often. Um, uh, now, as the, as the head of our estate department, Tammy, you know, we, we would see uh, probably one or two a month uh, where people have done their own and they haven't got it right. Uh, uh, courts won't accept the documents, uh, insurers, financiers, uh, planners, large institutions will not accept those documents if they're not executed properly and it costs thousands to get them to find. Um, quite simply, uh, it costs a little bit more to get a law firm to do it, but to me the extra is actually about the insurance. If you do your own and you get it wrong, your relatives pay. Uh, if for whatever reason we get it wrong, we pay because we've got a million dollars worth of negligence insurance and we fix the problem. Uh, so the extra, if you, if you want to look at it that way, the extra is really just about insurance to make sure that your relatives don't have to pay to clean up the mess because you saved a few dollars at the front end and cost your relatives thousands at the other end. Some of those um, wills actually can't be saved and that's when um, the state government intestacy wills kick in and your assets don't go where you want them to go and that's a real problem. Mm. So yes you can do your own. I do like enough to do it yourself brain surgery. It's, it's not something that you really should be doing and the amount of money we're talking about saving at the front end is not worth the many, many thousands that it can cost at the other end if it's not right. Okay. What is the difference between an executor and a trustee? Okay, executors are the people named in your will who have the responsibility of gathering your things and send them where you want them to go in accordance with your will. Some of the tasks that executors perform involve uh, gathering money in and holding that money for a period of time. Uh, that those funds might be held while uh, a child uh, comes of age, um, children under 18 can't receive those funds until they reach that age. Your will might in fact have a trust in it that says uh, I want my executors to hold these monies until my child reaches 21 or 25 or whatever it is. You set those boundaries. While your executors are holding items and monies for you, they uh, become trustees of those funds. So they have an extra set of responsibilities. Um, Executors and trustees, uh, those expressions are often used interchangeably in a will and that is okay because the responsibilities overlap. While your executor is holding your assets, um, your executor acts as trustee. The Trust Act, which is a, an act of parliament, gives them an additional set of responsibilities that they have to comply with. Not difficult, but they're still there. Um, so uh, for all practical purposes, they do overlap. Your executor will have the same responsibility, will have trustee responsibilities as well. Okay, thank you. <laughs> will the guardian for my children I appoint in my will be the guardian when I die? Not always. It's probably the shortest answer I can give. Now, um, a lot of people think that appointing a guardian in their will um, indicates that uh, those people uh, must take over day to day care uh, for my children or that um, uh, they uh, take over day to day care no matter what anybody else says. Now appointment of a guardian under your will actually doesn't do that. Uh, uh, what used to be called custody is now called um, whom your children live with. I changed the terminology every few years. Most people still call it custody. Um, custody is very different from guardianship. Uh, guardianship is a, is a more broad um, uh, 
a little more loose concept. Guardianship involves having a say in the uh, general life's direction of these children, where they go to school, um, uh, what, what activities they perform in their life, not necessarily feeding, sheltering and clothing them. Oftentimes, that's how it works out, but they are actually in two different concepts. Now, uh, appointing a guardian in your will is not an ironclad, unimpeachable, unassailable appointment. The family court will always reserve the right to intrude in that decision and try and make a decision that the court believes is in the best interest of the children. Um, so even if you do appoint a guardian and say, I want these children uh, to be under the guardianship of these people, the court may still say, no, that's not what we're going to do. They're not the day-to-day -day arrangements. We're overriding that. What guardianship in your will actually does is it expresses a very clear preference for people that you want guiding the life's direction of your children. So um, if there is to be some kind of dispute, sometimes you would call the type of love where you've got two sides of the family that both believe that they're the ones that are best suited to care uh, for uh, these children. Uh, an expression of guardianship is a very clear indication to a court or to anybody else that this is what you want to happen. And regardless of where the children might live, that appointment of guardianship will still stand so that those people will be entitled to have a say in the life's direction of the children. Um, if uh, the people who have day-to-day -day care and control of the children want to shave their head and dress them in sheets down and out of the airport handing out roses, the guardians will be able to say, well, look, no, that's not in keeping with the lifestyle that the, that the original uh, parents had. That is not something that they would have envisaged and we want that stopped. And in fact, it will give them the standing to go back to the court and say, this is an inappropriate lifestyle for these children. So it's not exactly custody uh, and it's not exactly ironclad, uh, but it does at least give you the ability to, um, to express a very strong preference. Does my superannuation form part of my estate? No, it doesn't. Uh, and that always lights up the phones of the radio station. But uh, no, it doesn't. Uh, the very common misconception, unfortunately, even sometimes inside our profession, is that superannuation forms part of your estate and you can leave it as you please. Um, that's actually not true. Uh, the, uh, th there are two types of super. There's, there's, um, publicly managed super, uh, the sort that uh, most salaried employees have, um, and then there is self-managed super where the superannuation fund is set up specifically for the benefit of uh, the uh, money earner uh, and where uh, they have direct control of the investments through a trust, um, through a trust team. Um, with publicly managed super, which is 95% plus of us, uh, the superannuation fund trustee, the AMPs and colonials of this world, uh, they actually have a discretion written into the rules. The rules of these super funds are contained in the trust deed, uh, and there is a discretion in that deed, in all of the major deeds, um, that uh, allows the trustee to release your super to anyone who fits the definition of dependent. Now, that might not be the person that you want to receive. So, um, that's absolutely extraordinary. And I can hear people now saying, well, that's wrong, why, why, why? Uh, the thinking goes like this. Uh, Johnny finishes school, uh, the age of 15, gets his first job, sits down with the paymaster, the paymaster says, Johnny, who gets your super? And he says, oh, I don't know, I'm mum. So, Mum's written on the form, uh, 40 years, two marriages and five children later, if Johnny expires, um, the superannuation trustee looks at the form and says, Mum, I can't do that. We've got five children and two spouses here. So the, the trustee has a discretion to look at the situation up at the far end um, and look at who the dependents are and to make that distribution. Now, 
um, there is a, a Congo clause to bring waste and complaints tribunal that's supposed to referee these disputes. Um, the trustees and the tribunal get it wrong all the time. And we are constantly having to try and straighten up the exercise of this discretion. Uh, now, uh, it's not that many years ago, maybe five or six years ago, the federal government said, all right, all right, we'll allow you to take that discretion of the trustee and make what's called a binding nomination. So that's effectively where you sign a form, it goes to the trustee, your super fund that says, I don't want you to have that discretion anymore. I want my super to go to this person and this person and this person and that's it, no matter what. Uh, but there are two catches. Uh, the first is that they've deliberately made it a little bit difficult to make a binding nomination. So you can't accidentally make one. Um, and the second is that the binding nomination lapses every three years. So you've got to keep remaking it. The idea being that you won't get uh, two spouses and five children down the track before you realise that your binding nomination doesn't work anymore. Um, so that's a bit of a pain, but if you have significant super, and as you know, as the head of our uh, state department, super is now, um, in more cases than not, it's the largest asset there is. It's larger, it's more in value than the family home. Particularly because um, a lot of these super farmers have sold life insurance policies so that when you expire, the life policy payout tips into your super. We now have people in their 20s uh, who have only been working a few years. They expire unexpectedly. Uh, they might have $20,000 in super, but $500,000 in life insurance that tips in. So you've got people with half a million dollars in super, completely unattached to their will, completely, um, well, I'd say completely unregulated, but where they have no control over who gets that super unless they make a binding nomination. Now you can actually make a binding nomination um, to tip your super into your estate. And if you're not really sure where you're going, that's not a bad way to go because then um, it, it falls into the hands of your executors who distribute it according to your will and that's the most up-to-date document about what you want done with your things. So that's, it, unless there's something more specific that you want to do with your super, that's actually not a bad way to go. Uh, this whole um, uh, superannuation field um, is not being regulated or clarified as fast as the world is going. Uh, the regulations are uh, falling behind uh, what we're seeing every day, particularly with, um, with the growth in uh, life cover being sold and um, it's paid for out in super. So the life company comes along and says, how would you like to have half a million dollars worth of life insurance that you don't have to pay for out of your own pocket? People say, oh, great. And uh, every month a little bit of money comes out of your super. You need a no more care. Um, but um, we've got very young people now passing away with super that way outstrips the value of their home, um, yet it's not catered for anywhere. So this is now a fairly big battle round uh, with um, the administration of disputed estates. Um, it is a bit of a nuisance to make a binding nomination, uh, and I haven't seen it yet, um, but um, I imagine it won't be long now before we see somebody say, um, why didn't the super fund trustee tell me that my nomination was lacking? Um, super fund has no obligation to tell you. So uh, they are doing it, but they don't have an obligation to do so. So you have to monitor your own three year limit and say, yes, I want to renew my nomination. Um, so uh, it's, um, it's a bit of a nuisance, but given the size of super fund payouts now, um, it's really something that needs to be done as part of your estate planning, making sure that your things go where you want them to go and that your relatives don't have to pay to clean up a mess at a time when you're not around. Very important. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, Guy. Thank you.